You're listening to Casting Class, an engineer's guide to manufacturing aluminum castings, hosted by Batesville Products. For over 75 years, Batesville Products has been engineering, casting, machining, inspecting, and polishing aluminum castings for over 70 industries nationwide. In today's episode, we'll continue to share our experience and industry secrets. Casting Class is in session. Again, uh, welcome. Uh, so what we have here is, is we have Tim Weber, uh, Vice President at Batesville Products. We have Jeff Reed, who is our Automation Engineer here at Batesville Products. We have myself, who will be uh, kind of hosting everybody, asking some questions, you know, get, getting the chat going around at the table here. Uh, we have Jeff Schmidt, Jeff Wright, and Jeff Graham, all from NEF. Uh, Jeff Schmidt is a Robot Specialist. Uh, Jeff Wright, a Key Account Manager. And Jeff Graham is a, a Product Manager here. Um, so a lot of expertise in the room today on automation, uh, on robots, um, and on how they're implemented in the manufacturing setting. Uh, so with that, we'll go ahead and get started here. So why automate? You know, what's the reason people are automating now? Well, I mean... It- at this point in time, there's such a there's such a large labor shortage. We're seeing it in just about every industry, um, every type of position. It, it's really top down. It could be managers, it could be engineers, it could be operators, maintenance. So we focus obviously with automation robotics on on the operator level. And you know there was a time when I think people saw robots as a um, as possibly taking people's jobs. You know, just just like when we went to automated gas stations. You know, the guy pumping the gas tank, the gas wasn't doing it went off to do something else. So we didn't really introduce ourselves, but NEF is an industrial automation distributor. What we've really enjoyed um, with, with the collaborative robot products that we're, that we're specialized in is that in most cases, we're redeploying people or we're giving them assistance. We're, we're having the robot do the heavy lifting and letting the, the person do the use their brain, use their, their hands, their, their eyes, you know, the things that human beings are good at versus just repetitive motions and, and, and strain and those types of things. I mean, like Jeff said, there being an aid to all your employees. Okay. Um, so where you have the repetitive motions and you run into your ergonomic issues and somebody has to take a break because they're taking this grinder and they're polishing a part or manhandling a part all day long, the robot doesn't get tired on that. So, you know, that efficiency there lets them focus on doing your inspection, do your quality checks where the robot is taking over that repetitive motion and eliminating your ergonomic issues. Yeah, and we do have direct you know, replacement or redeployment where, where the robot will just take over the job and, and it'll run. Sometimes we're even running lights out. Mm-hmm. Um, it's getting to be more and more common where there, there's no operators, there's nobody around. You know, all the robots can easily tie in and notify you, notify the different personnel on what they need. And so, you know, to, to speak to that, it's, it's, it's really application dependent, whether we're assisting or we're redeploying or, or some, some combination of maybe it's taking a, a three or four CNC machines and, and having one operator instead of four and having that person kind of uh, manage the robot, so to speak. So, so Jeff, I like the word you, you keep using, and I think it, it's, it's big still in the manufacturing market. A lot of people are out there thinking robots are going to replace or take their jobs. And you keep using the word redeploy. Um, so what we've seen here is, is a lot of different need for, um, I guess, you know, job function or different need, you know, as far as being able to program. So I think that that word redeploy is very important, especially with today's market where we're having a lot of, a lot of job openings, a lot of availability. Are you guys seeing that same thing? Are you guys seeing an assist in the, the job market out there today where, you know, people, there's X amount of people looking for jobs and there's even more that, you know, are open there? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, where this robot really shines uh, is mundane tasks. Okay. So when you have a person doing a mundane task all day, um, that's really where we could do something like this. Okay. And we could redeploy that person if something a little bit more important uh, or, or a human can really shine. Right? So uh, having a, a human do the mundane task, when there's other things that could be done, doesn't really make a lot of sense. So that's really where this fits in. Awesome. And I've also seen the robots like this really help with employee retention. 
because you can take somebody that was doing this mundane task, constantly thinking in the back of their mind, man, I'm going to go somewhere else and get a better job. Well, now you can easily take them, somebody that's been with you for 10, 15 years, doing an awesome job finishing, knows what they're looking at. You can quickly teach them how to use this arm and let them feel more involved in the process and more involved in the company by having this value add. And now they can impart their knowledge and let the robot do it. I, I'd like to think that, you know, you take somebody out of that highly intensive labor job and let them manage this pretty blue robot. And the next thing you know, they're they're wanting to stay long. Yeah. And how much traveling hours does he have? Yeah. You don't want to lose him. You know, can't lose yeah, him. Yeah. Yeah. But he's tired. Yeah. And you know, I mean, yeah. you're not, we, we all, I, hey, I, I worked at UPS. I got tired too. Yeah. You, you go and you talk to these people that have that tribal knowledge and then you empower them with some automation or some exactly. skill sets. And all of a sudden, you've got the best employee you've well, ever had. He's never lost. going to leave. Oh, yeah, they've lost. And and I, I just I see that over and over again, guys. And it's you know I can't. My wife keeps reminding me I can't save the world. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to try not to. But you know maybe one 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 robot at a time. So you know people get excited. I mean when they're learning something new, it doesn't matter what level you are for the company. People want to do a good job, and they can say, look. I can do this. I can gain this skill set. I mean, that's going to help with retention. I mean, a lot of people want to progress through companies and work their way up. Well, I know Tim already brought one up, but let's take a look at some examples here. We have a, the saw robot, which is taking care of the castings, getting ready for the machining process. Uh, we utilize different size blades, different RPMs. Uh, that is classified as an industrial robot with a high payload. In this case here, we have full guarding. Not something you would really want to do without the proper protection, but it is a uh, definitely a time saver. Uh, the, the people that would be doing this in place of the robot would be standing in front of a bandsaw, manhandling parts. That would get very old after eight to 10 hours. Foundries have used robots way back because of the danger issue mm -hmm. you know we dabbled in it years ago but you know now fully embracing it but you know that that safety part of it you know mm -hmm. it's a big deal yeah. it's a big deal the other thing is it's now it's it's like a pre machine young operation so it was so much more accurate so now they go to the machine into to our machine shop and they've got much uh repeatable cuts yeah and i think you know, state a couple here reduces labor and danger but Reality too, it, it reduces some of the cost for the your, your customer as well because you're getting into this the, the robotic side of things, and you said it's more accurate. You're coming in here and doing close to or if not machining cuts um, and reducing scrap potential from you know taking a, a manual operation and sawing into a potential part. Um, so you see a lot of different benefits here, um, you know, from a from an industrial size robot as well. industrial robot. We have a grinding uh, sanding attachment. Uh, we would present the part to the belt for the sanding operation. So Tim, where, where would you see this polishing robot? What, what, what kind of work would you see being put on something like this? So you guys stay here, it makes polishing, you know, heavier parts a lot easier. The thing I like about this is, you know, we can play around with what the finish is. So that part might stay on there. It might start off traditionally, you start out with an 80 grit and a 120, 240, something like that. And then we go to a heavy duty manual buff. What if we could run through a couple more belts and get it almost almost to a buff without it leaving the cell? You know, we've got a great guy down there. He's, 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 he's just built like a, a linebacker. He does use our only buffer left, you know, and then those guys, that's that's a tough job. Mm -hmm. Now you do something like this and you make it, you know, well, nah, this is manageable. You know, it's got more ops. But you know, it never leaves a cell. You know, it's just the different things that we can do inside that cell using, you know, repetitive uh, motion. Um, we're not worried about wearing somebody out. You know? Is it okay if I speak a little bit on the uh, mobile robots? Really? Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so this is our mobile robot line that, that NEF represents. This is uh, Mir, Mobile Industrial Robots. They're the sister company to Universal Robots, owned by the same parent company. 
And this has been a little longer time to figure out for us. We've had this line for about five years, and, and, and I think we in the industry are really starting to figure out where these belong. But I'm sure people on this uh, call have work truck drivers in their facilities, and they have um, people pushing carts around. And I'm going to address carts first and work truck second. But if you got people pushing carts around, I was a co-op at Guardian Glass. I knew where to get lost. <laughs> <laughs> I knew where to hide in the center day. Right. And I'm, maybe I'm being mean, but, you know, let's keep those people at the machine being productive and let the, the robot come and pick up the part or bring out the, the next raw material. That's probably two thirds of our projects these days. Fork trucks are the other thing. We're not going to replace your fork trucks back in your warehouse. You know, we're not going to load trucks. We're not going to load wrappers. But what we can do is get your fork trucks out of your facilities because fork truck accidents are the number one accident in the United States right now. And they're expensive. The trucks are expensive. They're, you know, we, the kids, the young people, the old people, whoever, they drive them like they're any 500 car racers. They beat the hell out of them. They cost money to maintain. Those people are usually your highest paid employees. So you, you take a, that little robot there that's actually looks like a small World War I tank with a pallet on top of it. Maybe you've got your operators loading the pallet with the finished goods. The robot comes in, picks it up, drives it out to the warehouse, drops it on another platform. Then the fork truck drivers stay in the warehouse and they can load the truck or do whatever. So it's disruptive technology. It's stuff that wasn't available a, year, a few years ago and it's labor savings. It, it was available 30 some years just ago. not very good <laughs> it wasn't very good no yeah, the, uh, yeah. the fly by wire you yeah and the wire in the floor and now we have yeah. gps systems we have magnets in the floor uh, the, the, these do not require ahead. no magnets no magnets it's, it's all gps they use lidar and camera systems so walk around your facility it's taking images with a 2d camera mm -hmm and with laser sensors and picking up on key components in your facility. Yes, uh, what's, what's really cool about that, what he just mentioned is as it drives around your facility, put it in teach mode, it creates a map. So, yeah, 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 so it creates a map of your floor. So it has all of your aisles documented and whatnot. And that's the software, right? You use that map as your software. There are no more lines in the, in the ground that it has to follow. Uh, so you can put the points on the map where you want it to go and tell it what action you want it to do when it gets to that point. It's kind of like a Google Google map. And if something in your environment changes over time, you can reteach it. It has a preferred path that it wants to take. But if somebody does leave a pallet in its way, it's going to come up to that and recalculate to go around. And then the next time it comes back through that path, it's going to take its preferred path again. are considered collaborative robots or as people will call them cobots that the, the the real difference between a cobot and a traditional robot is 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 really is the ease of programming it, it puts that puts the ability to program puts the ability to maintain puts the ability to redeploy into the hands of the facility so you don't have to have a robot specialist that's minding that that system so it doesn't mean you don't have a robot specialist but it does mean they can go home at night and maybe the maintenance team on third shift can still be trained to do a joint replacement or, or touch up a point. Whereas with traditional robotics, that might not be the case. This is a, a, something that happened here at BPI. I scheduled a long weekend. So we have a, we have a robot in a crate. Word went out that uh, we're going to install the robot while you're gone. Okay. I got the, uh, they did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Did they let you come back? <laughs> I had resources. Door. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> but uh, you know, truly, uh, you, you know, easy, amazing that uh, you can take a high tech device, hook it up to the end of the robot, and load the software off of a USB thumb drive, and you're operational in, in 15 minutes. I mean, that's really been the secret sauce of, of Universal Robot's success. I can't say every. Cobot on the market has that feature, but but that's definitely been what's driven this over the years. We've, we've actually got, a, and I can't name names yet because contract has been signed, but there is a, a key um, traditional industrial robot company that's now partnering with a, with a software company to come up with a easy to use front end, very similar to the universal robot front end. Well, in the, in the automation world, where your imagination ends is where the possibilities end. Yeah. Yeah, these things have opened the door to so much that uh, it's amazing, and, and and it's going to grow. It's going to become more prevalent. Take a look at the URs because they truly do have the software that is easy to implement, 
uh, the UR Academy on the web. A lot of information in there. They are the Kleenex of collaborative robots. I mean, th th there was no such thing as a collaborative robot before Universal Robot in introduced this in, two oh gosh, I forget what year it was, 2008, I think. Um, things change every day. The terrain is changing daily. It's hard for me to keep up, but it's my job. Mm -hmm. This technology we have here today didn't exist eight years ago. So we, we weren't selling robots that people, anybody could program off the street or that anybody, that we didn't have to put a cage around. That was very new. It was, it was disruptive. The, the mobile robots, AGVs have been around for a long time, but now we've got mobile robots that are like self-driving cars. We map the facility. So all this is all this is new. You know, there's there's robots that have been around for 50 years, right? But this this newer disruptive technology is creating more opportunities for success. Yeah, so something that we haven't discussed yet, which I think is one of the coolest things about the robot is, you know, it's it's a very fast growing robot industry. It might be the fastest growing robot industry. Um, so every other uh, company has taken notice and there's a lot of third party companies that have started to develop product specific uh, parts or end of arm tools for their universal robot specifically, whether it's a, a gripper like this, you can see it mounts directly onto the robot, um, vacuum systems, sanders, any kind of finishing. Um, so we call that the, our ecosystem. So it's got this ecosystem of different products from third party companies specifically for the universal robot, for whatever your application may be. So if you have a specific task you needed to do, but you aren't really sure how to design or make end of arm tools, odds are there's something already out there for this robot that you can take advantage of. Yeah, like Jeff said, it's got a quick connect plug. The plug on the robot is a standard interface. You load a template into the robot controller, and it knows then all of the criteria of this end of arm tooling. This is a servo motor in here. Then I can give it criteria based on the position for open and close. Depending on my part style, I can give it the speed that I want it to open and close, and then I can also have it look at the force. So if I want to close until I see a certain force, and that's how I know I have a part accurately gripped, um, you know, this robot has four sensors built into every joint to apply a certain amount of force. Um, the other, the other side note is, is, is they do have the ability to run unguarded. We have these running next to people in many cases. We also have them running with cages around, just like traditional. So that's, that comes down to a risk assessment. And uh, for some people, they don't understand a risk assessment. Uh, it's basically a legal document that you're stating what type of injuries could occur. Uh, severity of the injury, you're basing your process or your design of your process to that, that risk assessment. But it just opens up more opportunities. You know, we had a painting application a few years ago at a automotive manufacturing facility. We needed to we needed to paint the inside of the wheel well, and they use another brand of robot, and they weren't really interested in you are until they realized that they didn't have to put a cage around this. They did their paint area was was did not have the room for a full caged up systems. So we got that win and now that customer has become one of our top customers. They still use traditional robotics, but they're also using collaborative robots. You know, and another thing with this that I don't think we've really hit on is the redeployment. Just because you purchase the robot for one application, if you lose that product line, you can easily take this and redeploy it get the robot in there and use it in that application and then move it. I mean, tooling's cheap. We put probably 30% of our systems are on rolling carts or rolling pedestals. We've seen this where they'll move it from machine to machine and that's how they get the return on investment. Because even though I would say return on investment isn't as important today as it was a few years ago, it's hard to find people. You certainly want to be able to pay for the equipment. With this type of product, because you can program it yourself, you can integrate it yourself. You know, a traditional robot cell is going to typically cost anywhere from one hundred and fifty thousand dollars up to a million dollars. If you if you were to pick up a UR10, for example, it's a fifty thousand dollar robot. You maybe you got another ten thousand dollars worth of stuff: tooling, grippers, rolling base. You're at sixty grand. Your operators are probably costing forty or fifty thousand dollars these days. With 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 overtime, with because they're all working overtime. Got healthcare. You got time people not showing up, all of a sudden you've got that robot system paid for in, in just maybe less than a year, or just a little bit over a year. If you're running a couple ships, it's, it's less than a year. 
So these things pay for themselves very quickly. And then to Jeff's point, they can be redeployed. And it's something it's it's a, it's an employee that's never going to leave. Right. Right. Worst case scenario, you might need to send it to the hospital every now and then for employment replacement. <laughs> <laughs> but what person's not going to have that, right? I, I think you know. I heard two two, two pretty valid points there, and you, you said the uh, the comment of fifty percent of people who uh, are looking at robots now haven't used them, and I'd be surprised in the foundry industry if it wasn't even lower, right. or I guess higher. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Um, because you know what, and, and I know the foundry industry is working really hard on that because a lot of what people think of you know, when they see or hear foundry industry is hot foundries and poor, you know, dark, dirty places, poor and stuff, and really trying to, uh, you know, put put the robotics, you know, on a, on a different level because it's it's like you mentioned, it's it's cool, it's uh, it's different, it's really changing the industry for sure. Uh, but I think more importantly, the second thing was the the health and safety. You're talking about, you know, sending this to the hospital and get a joint replacement or whatever that is, but um, you know, really it's the health and safety of the employees here. So you mentioned, you know, the linebacker being able to stay on even longer. Um, you know, what, what would that have done for his career had he had that, you know, 40 years ago because he is a 40 year employee um, or, or somebody starting off today and what, what longevity does that have in, in that type of person? You know, if you look at resources these days, what's, what's really valuable? People. I mean, people are our biggest resource. In the United States, we have phenomenal workforce. And, and, and I don't believe in, that people are just sitting home doing nothing. I think people are looking for a better life. Um, and if you give them a better life, they're going to stick with you. You know, don't you just have to stay a little more competitive than your neighbor? If you just got a little better working environment, or you got a little better value proposition, you're going to keep the employees. And yeah, yeah, these guys did it right, too, because they. this was a Kaizen event. They owned it. And the excitement down there was, you know, was so, it was just crazy. You know, that also is, I mean, somebody talked about the employee retention. I mean, they see the company and they see they're going, you know, cutting edge stuff. And, hey, this is cool and I'm part of it. You know, and, hey, this is in my department. Well, doing this for many years, I can say I've seen more jobs created by robotics than I have seen eliminated. But the, as far as robotics go, you're creating jobs. You're not taking jobs away. It's fun. Very truly enjoyable to uh, pat yourself on the back and say, I did that. Just like you said, you're creating a higher skilled employee. It's not somebody that's just sitting there grinding away in a park. It's somebody that can look at the programs, can troubleshoot the mechanical side of everything. And that's, you know, bringing us as a country up higher in our employable personnel. Even even a state or a county or a city, you know, you're you're making more skilled labor out there, and you know, as much as you know, somebody wants to do an easy task, I think everybody could appreciate the fact that it it's making them smarter people, it's making a smarter workforce out there. Yeah, you know, I like to tell stories. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I've, I've had a unique experience this year. Uh, a, a longtime customer, one of the largest uh, um, OEM machine builders in the state of Indiana, they, they primarily focus on. Uh, Motor assembly, motor winding. They do some jet. They do large general automation lines, and he kept hearing about cobots, cobots, cobots. So we had lunch one day, and he's like, "Well, I should probably just buy a robot, and we'll start telling our customers to use these and said, I'm like, "No, no, please don't do that. Don't don't buy a robot from me." Right. I, I really did because that wasn't a good plan. Well, through a longer story, we came to the conclusion there was a, an opportunity to do finishing and deburring and cutting. You know, anything that's going to have like circular interpolation, that type of thing. So here we are six months later, they've got a developed system with tool changers, easy to use programming. The vice president of the company wrote the program. And then I, and then he called me last week and he goes, I can't do this anymore, Jeff. I have a job, <laughs> but I'm getting, you're, you're, fill, you're, we've got like 20 people, including BPI that we've referred to him. He's like, I can't keep up. I need a guy. I just happen to have a young man that used to, is my, my, my son's best friend. And he never went to college, but he went into the Air Force. He's in the Air National Guard now. He's really, he, he works on the A-10s, he's, you know, fixing them and that type of thing. And, and Eric used to be in the Air Guard. So I'm like, man, why don't you talk to Caleb? Caleb started this week. He's going to be their robotics expert. He'll be at our, on, he's done the online training that you mentioned, which anybody can do. He's going to come down to NEF for a, a, a factory level two-day training. And that young man in a year is going to be a robot engineer. And he didn't have to go to college. And, and, I, and there's a lot of kids that can't or don't want to do school. And here we're going to have this young man who's going to probably have a six-figure income, 
at, you know, in a couple of years and a skill set and pride and all the things you talked about. And that, that touches me because Eric's one of my oldest customers. Caleb's like a son to me. And I got, I was in a fortunate position to put those two, two together, but there, we have all these people out there that didn't want to go to college. I didn't want to go to college. I, my wife made me. <laughs> I struggled through for 10 years and got done. But they're smart and they're talented. And, and we can train them to do automation versus loading a machine. I think the companies that recognize that and think outside the box are the companies that are going to be prospering. And the companies that continue to say, put their head in the sand and do the business the way they always have are probably going to struggle. And it's going to come to a point where you're so far behind, you're not going to catch up. Tim's trying to wrap this up. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was going to say, you know, I think uh, let's see that Q thing. We, we, could, we could talk forever about this, especially yeah. with uh, with the uh, knowledge and, and experience we have in this room today. And we really appreciate everybody for joining us. Thanks, Jess and yeah. uh, Tim. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thanks. You're listening to Casting Class, an engineer's guide to manufacturing aluminum castings hosted by Batesville Products. Be on the lookout for our next casting class on the first Wednesday of every month. Until then, you can find more resources like videos, written guides, and case studies on our website, BatesvilleProducts.com. That's BatesvilleProducts.com. See you next month.